welcome to Faith and Fitness Magazine. I am excited today to be able to have a guest that I didn't think I'd ever get to interview somebody like this. It's an Olympic athlete, somebody that has won medals in the Olympics. And the extra bonus, in my opinion, is that he is a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. So I'll let him do some more introduction of himself. But for now, Jonathan Horton, welcome to our program today. Yeah, thanks, Brad. I appreciate the invite. Um, I guess for everybody that's, um, you know, not a big gymnastics fan, uh, that's okay. It's not, it's not the most popular sport in the world unless it's an Olympic year, but I had a good run as an Olympic athlete. I did gymnastics for 28 years, and when I was 22, I made my first Olympic team in 2008, competed for Team USA in Beijing, China, won a bronze medal with the team, a silver medal individually on the high bar, and then in 2012, I also qualified for a second Olympics where I finished in fifth on the high bar and our team finished in fifth as well. So we walked away with no medals in 2012, but I made five world championship teams. I won the national title twice, um, six time NCAA national champion. And uh, so, yeah, I've been around the block in terms of the sport of gymnastics, loved it. And uh, now both my kids are in it. I've got an eight year old son, five year old daughter. My wife was also an elite um, level gymnast. And so it kind of runs in the blood and we're just, uh, you know, I'm not the tallest guy in the world. I'm five foot two and my wife's four foot 11. So we're a family of little gymnasts. Isn't that actually sort of an advantage though for people that are in gymnastics? Yeah, it can be. Um, surprisingly, I've, I've actually known a few taller gymnasts. I had a teammate in college. Um, he was a floor and vault specialist. His name was Rush Sheen. He was six foot three. And it was amazing to see Russ do what he could do on floor and vault. He's just a super powerful guy. And uh, he, I mean, he blew all of our minds to see, to see him perform. Cause it's not, it's not normal. Most guys are probably, I'd say the average male gymnast is around five, four, five, five. And so to see somebody who's six foot three was pretty impressive. And that high bar that you said you did, just how high is that bar? So, so the high bar is about with the mats underneath, it's probably about 10 feet up. Um, without the mats, it's a, it's from, from concrete to the bar, it's probably 12 feet. And when we fly off of it and do our big tricks and dismounts, I mean, we're, we're probably 14, 15 feet in the air before we come down onto the mats. So it is, uh, I don't, you know, I'm so used to seeing it. I don't know the perception of other people that aren't used to gymnastics, but it, it's pretty high. If you fall from it, you're going to probably be hurting a bit unless you are successful in your your landing. Well, you know, one of the first things we teach in gymnastics is how to fall properly. And we teach that to little kids from day one, because yes, in a sport that is as precision based as ours, you're going to fall a lot in the process of learning. And even in competition, I mean, I can, I can pull up video after video on YouTube of me crashing and burning, fall, flying off the high bar, the parallel bars, the rings, whatever. Um, but yeah, if you, if you crash wrong, um, you, you can definitely hurt yourself, but you know, that's why the mats and the technology and the and the matting and everything that we use is becoming better. And, you know, safety is a priority at this point because it, as the sport advances, it's becoming more like the X Games. It's a, it's a very extreme sport. People are doing crazy things that we hadn't seen, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Tell me about you. I mean, you're, you're telling me that you've got two children that are in gymnastics now. Um, can we assume that your parents were in gymnastics? And so this is just sort of following suit one after the other or um were you the first in your family to get into this yeah so good question i actually was the first in my family my my dad played baseball growing up my mom never did any sports and um you know i'll tell you a funny story i i was kind of a wild child and it just had a ton of energy i'm pretty positive that i probably probably would have been diagnosed with some kind of like ADHD or something as a kid if I were, you know, if I was born now, because I was bouncing off the walls. And I still, I think I've kind of learned to channel it a little bit, but my mind is just everywhere. Well, I was, uh, my mom tells the story the best, but when I was four years old, um, the reason I got into gymnastics was because of a, an incident that happened in the middle of a Target department store. Um, my mom took me shopping one day and she said that she was looking at some clothes and when she turned around, I was gone. I, I, you know, her four-year-old son was nowhere to be seen. 
And so she started to panic a little bit. She's looking all over the store. Five minutes goes by. She can't find me. Ten minutes goes by. She still can't find me. And now the whole store is searching for her four-year-old little boy. Okay, the manager spotted me and came up to my mom and said, ma'am, I found your son. You can calm down. And he pointed to the ceiling and he said, he's way up there. And apparently there was a 25-foot support beam in the middle of the store that I wrapped my arms and legs around. I climbed it to the top and I was all the way up to the top. You know, she said that it was one of the craziest days of her life seeing me at the top and then just sliding down like it was no big deal. And so she told my dad about it when he got home from work that night. My dad's exact words were, wow, our son's a freak. Hey, maybe we should try gymnastics. And so uh, they, they put me into a gymnastics facility the very next day and the rest is history. They had no idea what they were getting into. They knew nothing about the sport. And what do you know, 18 years later, I was competing at the Olympic Games for Team USA. So uh, from four years old all the way up to your competing, it was all smooth sailing. You just, you, you had this down, you were aging it. You were one of the best in gymnastics. Is that right? No. So uh, I'm going to have to send you one of my books, actually. I wrote a book a few years ago. It's my autobiography. Um, and that's the common misconception. And most people, they automatically assume that, oh, man, you're, you're an Olympian. You won medals. You must have been some kind of a prodigy as a kid growing up. You probably got into the sport. It was a perfect match. You won every competition and just, like you said, smooth sailing to the top. But in fact, that wasn't really, that's not my story. Um, when I got into gymnastics at four, I did fall in love with it. It was like, I mean, just, uh, it was a perfect, it was a perfect fit for a kid like me with the energy, the build that I had, um, you know, just being a, a smaller kid of stature, but truth be told, I'm kind of a slow learner. I'm not the most, you know, gifted talent, like with talent. And, uh, it took me a really long time to kind of find my niche in the sport. I can think of so many competitions that I left with absolutely nothing, no medals, no ribbons, no trophies, just tears in my eyes, you know, wondering like, why, why am I in this sport? I'm not very good. And then something kind of clicked around the age of 13. And I just, I figured out my style. Funny thing is, is most boys either figure it out or quit around the age of 12 or 13. There's like, there's no black, there's no gray area. It's either black or white. It's like, I got this, I'm going to move on or I'm done with the sport. It's too hard. And I probably should have been done with the sport, but I was too hard headed. And I just thought to myself, like, I love this too much to quit. I know I'm not the most gifted and talented, but I always tell people, you know, the word tells us that faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains. Um, well, I also kind of believe that talent the size of a mustard seed, when put in the work, can move mountains. And I just told myself, like, I'm going to put in the work until I figure this out and become one of the best. Because at a young age, I remember watching my first Olympics when I was 10 years old in 1996 and thinking, like, that's what I want to do. And it was just in my brain. It was ingrained. I was willing to do whatever it took. And there was no stopping me. You know, I've heard that uh, gymnastics can be an extremely expensive sport to be in. So if you were sort of having a rough time at it up to age 13, um, at any point did mom or dad go, uh, maybe we've spent enough on this. So that's actually a really, really good point and a good question you make. Um, because my, you know, I come from pretty humble beginnings. My mom and dad, uh, my mom was a teacher. Um, my dad kind of bounced around with different jobs when, when I was a kid. He eventually, once I went to, once, uh, let's see, I think when he got into high school, he had a pretty good position working for an engineering company. But, you know, we weren't, we weren't, you know, wealthy people by any means. And my parents, they put me in gymnastics, like I said, not knowing what to expect. And it got expensive and became a sacrifice very early on for them. They, uh, they had to, my mom specifically had to sacrifice a lot to keep me in the sport. And, uh, you know, because I think basically her, every dollar she made as a teacher went to gymnastics. It was, wow. it was they saw that I loved it and they saw that I loved it and they didn't want to keep me out of it. And so, um, you know, and they did that for my sister and I, my, you know, my sister kind of grew up in the, in, you know, dancing and, so, you know, here she is a competitive dancer. I'm a competitive gymnast. And my mom just, she worked so that we could have this recreation. And I'm so thankful for it. 
But yeah, my, they, they would joke all the time. I'd come home crying after a bad workout and they'd be like, so do you want to find another sport? And so I was always like, nope, this is the one I want to do. Um, and so I was very, very thankful for the sacrifices that they made. And they'll, they'll tell you now it was worth every sacrifice, every penny. You know, I had sponsors at, at the Olympics that paid my whole family's way to go to the Olympics and watch me compete. And to them, that was the greatest reward ever. Um, you know, my dad's not a big crier and I saw my dad with tears in his eyes because of how proud he was. And I mean, that's just an amazing thing for, for me as his son. Well, that's great to hear, um, that, uh, the parents were involved to that level. And I think that's a good testament to the strength of the family. Let's talk about your family for just a minute. I'm curious, uh, if you can share, has the Christian faith always been something, uh, of your life from childhood up, or is that something that it, it, you discovered it as a, at, a, at a later age? Yeah, so the, the answer to your question is both. Um, yeah, I, I love sharing my testimony with people because I did grow up in the church. Um, very, very fortunate that I come from a family of just people that are all in for Jesus, um, you know. And we grew up, we we're a Sunday, you know, going family, but we, you know, we, beyond Sunday, we, we just engulfed our lives in, in the gospel and how to be better and how to live for Christ. Um, but I, I would say, although I grew up in it, as soon as I moved away, as soon as I got out of the house, I quickly strayed from my faith. I never lost my faith. I never, you know, stopped, um, you know, believing in God and, and knowing the gospel of Jesus. I just, I think like so many people do, we, we just go down our own path. My, you know, my flesh and my desires let me, let, you know, kind of took over. And then I started having all of the success as an athlete. And I, you know, for, for many years, I would say, uh, I claim to be a Christian, but I didn't appear to be a Christian. Um, and I've always said I was, a, I was a very casual believer who thought, Oh, it's fine. Like I can get away. I can do whatever I want. You know, I can go out and party. I can live this crazy life. I can, you know, I can do these things and I, I'm, I'm forgiven, um, which is true. I am forgiven. But one of the things I always tell people is following Jesus. One of the things that we talk about is, is Christ being our Lord and Savior. And everybody wants to heaven one day, but not a lot of people want a Lord. And that's something that hit me one day that, okay, I know I'm saved because of my, my faith and my belief that Jesus died for me, but now I need to allow him to Lord over my life. I need to change these things. I need to repent of this sinful life that I'm living. Um, and it took a lot of brothers in Christ to surround, you know, surround myself with, hold me accountable. Um, my wife and I have just grown so much, um, in our faith the last, you know, probably five, six years, and it's, it's taken the body of Christ to surround us and for Jesus, you know, to constantly be praying that God wraps us in his Holy Spirit and, and of protection. Um, and so my, my life has changed dramatically. So yes, I grew up a believer, long, you know, long answer to your question, but I really found my faith and I've been chasing after God and Jesus and feel more so than ever. You know, the last thing that Christ asked us to do before he ascended to heaven was to go and make disciples of all nations. Um, you know, until the ends of the earth. And I feel so emboldened these days in my life until the end of my life from now on to go and share the gospel with people until the ends of the earth, because that's what we're called to do. You're already having some success in, in gymnastics and you're married, but you're not really where you know you should be with God. Is that how the scenario was or did marriage come later than the success? You know, my wife and I got married and my wife became a believer when she was 16. Um, and I think I, I think I was saved when I was nine or 10. And uh, so she she becomes a believer. We meet when she was um, actually right before she got to college. I was a freshman in college. She was a senior in high school. She came up to the University of Oklahoma where I was and we met, we started dating, we got married four years later in 2009 after we finished school. And um, we were just very lukewarm. Um, you know, you can, as you can imagine, all the things that college brings, just the bad decisions and the stupidity. Well, then tack on, um, you know, having success, success as an athlete, 
um, you know, a lot of people knowing who I was, seeing me on TV. And, you know, I went on a three month tour around the country surrounded by the world, you know. And so it it was very, very hard to, to battle alone, to battle the, you know, my fleshly desires alone. And, um, you know, I, I look back now and I see where I was then and where I am now. And, you know, my wife and I, we, ju- we just, we, it was the grace of God that he surrounded us with amazing people that showed us where we needed to repent of our sinfulness, where we needed to grow and make us aware of places we didn't think we were being sinful, but we were. And to show us like, hey, this is where we're, this is how I'm calling you to be. Um, and it's just, it's been an incredible transformation, incredible experience. And just the way that, you know, God has worked in our lives hasn't always been sunshine and rainbows. I think that's one of the things that I like to share with people too, is just because you've given your life to Christ, nowhere in the Bible does it say you're going to have an easy life. It says that you're going to have a fulfilled life in Christ, an abundant life in Christ, but that abundant life doesn't mean riches and easy life and every single day is going to be great. No, I mean, we've gone through some really hard times, but it's our faith. It is the truth of the gospel that has carried us through. I mean, coronavirus and the pandemic has been one of the hardest things we've ever experienced together. And I don't think that we would have had such an incredible year as a, as a couple and as a family, if it weren't for our faith, because I lost my old job. I didn't work for about nine months and we just had to kind of buckle down pray, stay faithful. And next thing you know, like the Lord provided a great position for me with a new company. It hasn't been this, like I said, this amazing sunshine, like easy ride for us. And it never should be. The, the Bible talks a lot about suffering and, you know, that suffering is used for the glory of God. And I think that's a very important thing for people to to remember as they go through their faith journey. So I, I know I'm going on a tangent here, but I just, I, I've become so passionate about what the word says, how to live that out as a, you know, in, in the most authentic way possible as a believer. Your gymnastics is doing well. You're getting sponsorship. You're married. A lot of people would say, you know, there wasn't any convenient reason for you to get more serious with God. And yet for some reason you decided to buckle down to start to make some choices that would probably in fact be more challenging. Truth be told, like the, the the hardest thing that we can do in our lives is to fully commit to our relationship with God. Because with that, you have to, you know, what does it say in, in the Bible? A lot of people don't fully understand this passage, but it's you have to circumcise the heart. You have to tear away the darkness from within your heart. Um, and there really wasn't, I mean, like I said, it was the grace of God that we you know, we just started being surrounded by all of these different people that were pouring into us. What is it they say? You're, you become the, the average of your five closest friends. Well, that's kind of what happened to us. Next thing we know, like our closest people in our lives were just pouring into us, you know, what it meant to truly be a believer and to follow the teachings of Jesus. We don't realize how important of a role that can have in the life of somebody else, but you're saying that those five people uh, or however many there were, they actually were significantly influential in your life. Unbelievably influential. And, you know, when we look back on it now, those people, they've become some of our best friends. We do life with them. Some of them are people from the gymnastics world that we're reconnected with. And it's just, I mean, it's amazing the story that God has put together because we've allowed him to just come into our lives and take over everything. I mean, I could go on and on and on about just the path that we've taken to where we are and the friendships that we have and the community that we have now, it takes people in your, in your corner um, to battle what the world tries to tell us is okay. And I mean, with the news and social media and everything that you've got, you've got, you know, people living their lives out in the open right now saying, this is the way to live. It's fine. It's, you can do this and do that. But when you have people around you and you, you have accountability partners, that's what we like to call each other, you can see the, the wrong in your ways and live according to the scriptures. And that's all, with, you know, us at our church that we go to, we always tell people our, our goal is to be an authentic reflection of biblical Christianity. That's all we want to do. We want to be authentic to the scriptures and live according to the scriptures. And in order to do that, 
you gotta have a community of people around you that are all battling the world to do so. In the first half of my conversation with Olympic medalist, Jonathan Horton, he has shared about how he got started in gymnastics and how that led to being on Team USA. For Jonathan, putting in the work is what it takes to achieve success. He talks about how a strong community of Christian friends has helped him and his family grow in Christ. In this second half, Jonathan talks about how important physical training is to him now. He is a professional speaker who talks about faith and fitness as he motivates people everywhere. He's discovering how God is providing for him and his family. And all along the way, he's found that you have to take risks and fall if you want to move forward and go big for God. In addition to the training that you do or did for gymnastics, did you also have a certain amount that was just general fitness or was it pretty much all directed toward gymnastics? Whenever I was younger, it was strictly gymnastics. And a lot of people, they always ask me, I have guys come up to me all the time like, hey man, you know, you're, you're a pretty built guy. Like how much can you bench? And I'm like, I don't know. I, like, I've never bench pressed before. That was my answer years ago. We didn't lift any weights. There was no cross training or anything like that. Gymnastics in its purest form is all that we needed. Um, and, you know, my training in college, my training sessions were, we trained from six o'clock to eight o'clock every single morning. Um, and for two hours, we did a gymnastic style strength and conditioning. And then we would come back into the gym from two o'clock to six o'clock for another four hours of training where we did like our skills and routines and things like that. Never did anything outside of the gym. We didn't run. We didn't lift weights. We didn't do any of that. Um, towards the end of my career, I, I did gymnastics till I was 32 years old, which is kind of rare. Most people retire right out of college around the age of 22. Um, at the end of my gymnastics career, there were some extra things that I had to throw in there to keep myself as fit as possible. Started running, you know, one to two miles, three days a week. Started doing some light weights and some like rehab type stuff just to keep my muscles, you know, functioning properly. But ultimately what ended my career was from 2000, let's see, 2011 to 2015, I had a major foot injury that required three procedures, like one major surgery and two little small ones. And then in 2012, after the Olympics, my right shoulder had to be completely reconstructed in a six hour surgery. I came back from that after a year of intense rehab. And then uh, almost a year after that injury, I ruptured my pec, came back from that three months later. That was a pretty quick, quick recovery, actually. And then uh, the career ender in 2015 was uh, ruptured the supraspinatus rotator cuff muscle. So I was pretty bulletproof to about 26 years old. And I started having injury after injury after injury and even continued to try to come back after 2015. But, um, you know, my, my body just, there's only so much that I could handle, but you know, there are some little things that I did here and there to get me as far as I did into my career by adding a little bit of cross training, you know, doing a lot of research on diets, um, you know, other types of fitness that I thought were good for gymnastics that people weren't doing at the time. So yeah, you know, it was a learning, learning process for me. What, what's your exercise lifestyle these days? Yeah. So I've got a, I've got a, pretty steady workout schedule. So three days a week, I've become pretty big into running. I'd like to do a marathon eventually, but I'll run anywhere from three miles to 10 miles, three days a week. So it's like on Monday this week, I did three miles on Wednesday. I kept it pretty easy. I did two tomorrow. I'm planning on doing five or six. And then on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, I lift, I've got, you know, a bunch of weights and some machines in my garage. I actually I didn't have any equipment in my garage till coronavirus, but I was like, I need to work out. And so I was one of those guys that went out and got all the workout equipment. And so my wife and I, we're, we both are pretty big into fitness. So we both work out in the mornings before our kids go to school. And then I just like to, I like to change things up twice a week. So on Sunday and Monday, I actually have gotten really big into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I don't know if you know anything about jiu-jitsu, but it's a phenomenal sport. It's the best cardio I've ever done in my life. 
Wow. And uh, I've been been doing jujitsu for about three years right now. I uh, just got my blue belt in January. I absolutely love it. I'm I'm addicted to it, and it's super fun. The community of people is great, and uh, it's a pretty good confidence builder too. Nice. Well, congratulations on the blue belt. And I guess if you keep on working at it, you'll eventually get that black belt. If, uh... Yeah, it, it takes a while. You know, it's a unique martial art. Um, it takes on average 10 to 15 years to get a black belt in jujitsu. So do you have your own, uh, I think you do, your own business where you train up and coming athletes in gymnastics? The answer is yes and no. So I don't actually own any kind of local gym or anything like that. Whenever I say I lost my job because of coronavirus, what I used to do for a living is I used to travel around the country a lot and I put on clinics. I'd show up at, you know, gyms around the country and I would do, you know, anywhere from a one day to a three day coaching clinic. I did that for gymnastics. I did it for American Ninja Warrior because I've been on that show a bunch. And aside from, you know, my, my clinics and appearances, I also was a professional speaker. So I, since 2011, I've been speaking professionally in front of large companies. I've done events for, you know, 10 people, you know, companies as big as 10 employees. And I've done things for companies that have 2000 employees. When we're in a pandemic, you're not supposed to travel. You can't gather in large groups and companies don't really have the money to pay somebody to come out and do the things that I was doing for a living anymore. I also was a, uh, a partner for, with a company called Ninja Coalition. Um, we used to, we had a traveling Ninja Warrior course and we throw a bunch of equipment, you know, packs the 18 wheeler full and we travel around the country and set up this course. And we put on again, one to three day events where we teach kids about fitness. And what was really cool is the guy that I did it with was, uh, you know, he loves Jesus. He's an amazing guy. So we teach people about fitness and faith and Ninja Warrior. And I would always talk about gymnastics and we would speak to the kids and the adults that would come. So yeah, I've, I had a, a lot of different avenues of, of fitness and training that I did, but it was all remote. I, I don't really do anything here in Houston, Texas, where I live. People call me, they contract me to go out and I would work with them. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing how God works. During the pandemic, the very beginning, I knew, you know, my manager who helps me book a lot of this stuff, he called me and he was like, oh man, John, I don't know what to tell you. All of your stuff that we had booked for 2020 and some of 2021, it's all wiped out. I don't, I'm like, I don't know when this pandemic is going to end. I don't know when you're going to get any work. I'm sorry. And so uh, I just kind of had to call an audible in life and be in deep prayer about it. It's a, kind of a long story, but my brother-in-law is a pretty successful guy in the insurance world. And so uh, he was able to connect me. I got my insurance license. And now I work for a large Fortune 500 company, Sun Life Financial, selling corporate, uh, corporate insurance packages. So totally different than anything I've ever done in my life. But I, you know, I was so thankful that the Lord provided this. I work from home. It's kind of a desk job, but I really enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. Well, nice. Do you do any coaching locally? And the only coaching that I do from time to time is I go in and I work with my son. You know, my, my son is quite the little gymnast. He's eight years old. Um, he had an awesome first year as a competitive gymnast, um, state champion, which is a super proud of him. I'm super fortunate that my coach who trained me my entire career is now my son's coach. And so I don't really have to coach my son per se, because I trust the guy that he's being coached by. And it's, it's cool to kind of sit back and just watch the majority of the time. Have you thought about what ministry would look like for you? Have, have, have you ever thought, gee, God, what do you want me to do to, to get your uh, presence out there, to get the word out about you, to help people discover you? Like I said, I've been speaking for about 10 years, almost 10 years before the pandemic. And I had a church in California call me and ask me to come and do like a, an interview with a pastor in front of the church, which I'd never really done anything like that before. I've been in, I've spoken in front of churches, but um, not that style. And so I go to, I fly to California. I sit down with the pastor for three services in a row. We speak. And at the end of the service, the pastor goes, man. He goes, you almost kind of took over the whole sermon. He goes, have you ever thought about speaking, you know, as a, you know, coming in as like a guest, not so much a pastor, but just a, a speaker, someone to share your story and throw the gospel into your story and show people the way that God has worked in your life. Have you done that? And I was like, no, not really. He's like, well, I would really encourage you 
to find like really like pray about it and seek you know what the lord has done in your life and find you know biblical passages that kind of show you why the lord did what he did in your life and use that to speak into people there you never know who is at a church that is their first time visitor um, or somebody that's battling their faith but they're there and they hear your story and because of you you know, they come to Christ and he was like, it'd be really, really cool for you to start doing that. So I, I say all that to tell you, I was working on kind of some new material to almost like, you know, travel around and become like a, like a guest preacher, never got a chance to do it. And as the world hopefully kind of goes back to normal, I think eventually that's something that I want to do in terms of ministry. You had sponsorship when you were an athlete and that I'm assuming was pretty significant. Did they ever say, hey, keep the Jesus word to a minimum or anything else? It's tough, right? Because I'm so thankful for those sponsors that I had. You know, I was sponsored by companies like BMW, Ralph Lauren, Deloitte, um, let's see, BP, which is a, probably the biggest sponsor I ever had. Oh. And Please. they... They, you know, they never outright, yeah, yeah, Hilton Hotels was another big one. Um, you know, none of them ever outright said, hey, you know, hold the faith thing back. But there were often times that it was implied. I'm kind of a guy that, you know, even though at the time of those sponsorships, my faith wasn't where it is now, I was never afraid to share with people what I truly felt in my heart. And that was knowing the truth of who Jesus was. And so I, I've never really shied away from it. I think, um, you know, I'm not going to name them, but there was a large company that I used to commentate for, um, for gymnastics events. And I let my faith be known pretty well through them. And I no longer am invited to work with them anymore, but you know what? Like I'm okay with it. Um, if I were to lose everything that I have because of my faith, that's all right. We're, we're told it's in, it's biblical that we will be persecuted for our faith. Um, and I mean, look now, it just, it doesn't take You don't have to look far to see the persecution that's going on in the world. Look at what's happening to Christians in Afghanistan right now. Um, Look at what's happening to, you know, Christians in just here in the United States, people that speak up about their faith that they get canceled these days, you know? And so um, it's tough, but I think that us as believers, we have to recognize that it's part of it. Our persecution and our suffering because of the faith, it says in the word that it's for the glory of God. Oftentimes when I kind of felt that, you know, from, from sponsors or from work or wherever that like, Hey, you should probably rein in on this, this, this God thing. Like I've always been okay with it. I'm like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to speak my truth and share it. And if you want to, you know, persecute me because of that, I'm okay with it because I know it's going to happen anyways. Did you find that in fact, just the opposite happened that because you were obedient to Christ to put your faith out there and put him out there that in fact, things that you imagined might happen or the threats that they may have been made, in fact, they were far more easier to overcome and, and you had outcomes far greater than you could have hoped for. Well, I'll tell you the, the thing that has happened almost every single time is I always have people that I don't know are faithful to Jesus come out of the woodworks and say, hey, thank you so much for standing up for the faith. People that I, I didn't expect to uh, to almost, in, in a way, embrace me and say, we're with you. Um, and then it opens up more doors. It opens up new conversations. Um, and it is amazing the way that God works. When one door closes to one thing, he swings another one wide open. And I've seen it time and time again. There's been been a few times in my life where I kind of stood strong in you know my love for Jesus, and you know maybe something didn't go exactly the way I wanted, but something even better came from it. I've seen God's faithfulness um, in the greatest way I ever have. We went, I think it was, I think I want to say it was nine months without a single dollar of income. I had so many opportunities to, to do things online and remotely and try to like hustle here and hustle there. And I just, a lot of it felt kind of icky and it just didn't feel like, Hey, this is how I need to, this isn't what a a path that I want to go down. And as of recently, I mean, my wife and I, I would say that we are 
the happiest and in the best place that we've ever been because of where God has placed us. Um, my wife started a, a clothing company with her sister that has just taken off. Um, I have a completely new job that I never imagined um, that I'm so thankful for with great people to work with. You know, I always say like my tribe, my community of people around me, um, of people to, to just love on us and for us to love on them has grown. And in this time of struggle and this time of sickness and darkness in the world, I feel like God takes care of those that are faithful. It's not guaranteed, right? It's the best word I can say. I'm thankful and blessed for, for what he's done. And it doesn't mean that there's not going to be more challenges, but we just have to grow in our faith and accept, you know, that God's plan is perfect and it's bigger than our plan. Share with our uh, viewers here what it means to go big in your mind. Um, to me, going big is making sure that whatever you're going for, you don't look back one day and have a regret. And what I mean by that is no matter what it is in life, whether it's work, family, faith, sports. At the end of my days, God is calling me home. I would like to look back on my life and not have a single regret for the work that I put in. You know, truth is we have our days where it's like, I gave it everything. And then we also have our days where we fall short and we know we could have done more. But overall to me, going big at the end of the day, going, telling myself every single day, I went as big as I could. Sometimes I fell short, but I gave it my all and I had nothing left to give. And by doing so, I was faithful and I used the gifts that the Lord gave me to the best of my ability during my time here on this earth. Do you consider that to be a risky thing to do? I don't think it's risky at all. I think people would look back on my gymnastics career and I, I kind of was a pioneer of a lot of things, especially on the event that I won a medal on high bar. I took so many, some people would say unnecessary risks when I was younger and I was, you know, I fell probably more than anybody in my sport at major competitions. In fact, I can tell you, I know I did. I actually have at the 2013 world championships, I have the record for the most falls from any individual competitor from the United States in gymnastics. I fell six times at one major competition and led my team to a 13th place finish. Um, <laughs> nobody, nobody's ever performed worse than that, than me, but it's because of the risks that I took and the way that I always chose to go big that in 2008, I did a routine that had never been seen in history before, that even my coach just told me, hey, you're probably gonna fall on that. It's too dangerous, too risky. I said, well, I'm gonna either go for the gold or I'm not gonna go for anything at all. And I ended up nailing this routine in the competition. I know I won silver, but you know, there was a lot of controversy behind that silver. A lot of people thought that I should have been the gold medal Olympic champion. Go big and you're gonna fall a lot along the way, but eventually, you're gonna hit, you know, and the same thing with, with, with my faith. I know that if I'm bold and I share with people um, enough, I'm gonna fall flat on my face and there's gonna be a lot of people that reject the faith, but then I'll hit it big and somebody that was completely lost, that the Lord spoke to me and told me to talk to them is going to accept Christ. They're going to find God. And that's just the boldness and the bigness and the risks that we have to take. And yeah, it can be scary. But we have to be willing to fall so that we can move forward. And I know I'm pitching myself right now, but that's why I named my book, my autobiography, it's called Falling Forward. Because that's just, that was that was my career. I kept falling, falling, falling in order to move forward in every step of the way until I finally achieved what I wanted. Nice. So uh, I wanted everybody that's watching to check out Jonathan's book titled Falling Forward and uh, get a copy, in fact, get two copies, one that you can enjoy yourself and one that you can share with a friend that needs to be encouraged. This has been Faith and Fitness Magazine's interview with Jonathan Horton, Olympic gymnast, Olympic medalist. Be watching for more videos that inspire you to go big in your faith and your walk with God.